So as we've heard earlier on, the Chancellor believes the economy is at last on the turn and there is light at the end of the tunnel. Well, that's a relief, but with a huge round of new welfare cuts looming and intense pressures on the health and defence budgets, does this mean he will actually put his hand in his pocket? Chancellor, I'll come on to that in a second. But can I start by asking you about this poisoning in Salisbury? <clears throat> if it's proved, and I say if it is proved to be uh, an action of the Russian state, how serious is that for our relationship with the Russian government? Well, first of all, as you say, this is a police uh, investigation. Uh, it will be evidence-led, and we must go where the evidence uh, takes us. So we have to allow uh, the police investigation to take its course. But if uh, there were mm. to be uh, an involvement of a foreign state uh, evidenced by this investigation, then obviously that would be very serious uh, indeed, and the government would respond appropriately. You might have heard Marina Litvinenko suggesting that last time round the response wasn't nearly strong enough. And in that context, I wonder what you think now about the Magnitsky Act proposal, so-called, for much tougher visa restrictions and financial restrictions on named individuals. Well, the proposals that were put forward actually create a power that we already have. The Home Secretary already has a power to exclude individuals from the UK if she believes that they're presence here is not conducive to our national security or the public good. So it's not strictly necessary, but um, we, we're, we're seeking to reach an accommodation with those who've put this amendment forward. Let's see if we can come to a proposal which works for everybody. OK. Um, you were there as Foreign Secretary at the end of that Litvinenko inquiry, and you summoned in the Russian ambassador at the time. Uh, Marina Litvinenko suggests that what you did was not nearly tough enough. What's your message to her? Well, we did. Uh, we it, the, the inquiry, of course, um, took some time, and it was some time after the events before we had the uh, evidence from the inquiry. But we took uh, appropriate steps. We took measures which are still um, in place today. But you of course, kicked the, out a couple of diplomats. That was about all. Uh, but of course, the Russians uh, have not complied with their international obligations, despite being members of the Security Council. They have continued to protect those uh, who we seek. Uh, to extradite in respect of the murder of Mr. Litvinenko. And yet, in a sense, they are laughing at us in this country. They still think that this is a place where the, they can do what they like without uh, any serious repercussions. And London is still one of the prime places for Russian money to arrive. Do you need to look at the whole thing again? Uh, well, I think that the police inquiry and the depth and detail, the, the vast resources that have been uh, deployed, and the uh, um, uh, high-level assets that we have to be able to make these analyses show that um, nobody is laughing at us. This is a very serious investigation that's going on. Let's see where it leads us. Your party has taken massive donations from uh, Russian oligarchs and others. Do you think it's time to hand them back? Well, look, there are very strict rules about donations to political mm. parties. Only uh, British citizens who are on the electoral register here can make donations to political parties. All donations are carefully vetted. They're re reported to the Electoral Commission. But They're the recorded publicly. The, the facts have changed. Isn't it time to change your mind? Well, I'd, look, I, I think there, there are people in this country who are British citizens who are of Russian origin. I don't think we should taint them, we should tar no, them sure. with Putin's brush. Um, uh, we should recognize that people come to this country from many places. They become British citizens, they live under, the, uh, under UK law, uh, and, and they should have full participation rights in our society once they're British citizens. Light at the end of the tunnel, a turning point for the economy. You've given lots of examples about wage growth. You've talked about the effect uh, finally ending the austerity years of paying back the, the budget uh, day by day by day um, and, and all of that. It feels like a really, really important moment. Well, there is light at the end of the tunnel because what we're about to see is debt starting to fall after it's been growing for 17 continuous years. That's a very important moment. For us, but we are still in the tunnel at the moment. Uh, we have to get debt down. Uh, we've got uh, all sorts of other things we want to do. We've taken a balanced approach uh, over the last couple of fiscal events, using uh, flexibility that we had uh, to continue paying down debt, but also to provide additional support to our public services, to invest in Britain's future, and to reduce taxes for families and small businesses who are feeling the pressure. Well, for the 11 million people about to be hit by the next round of welfare cuts, is there any light at the end of the tunnel? Are you going to be able to help them in any way at all? Well, look, there's been quite a lot of speculation in the media about what the OBR numbers will be uh, when they're published on Tuesday. 
I suggest we wait until we see uh, the numbers. This is not a fiscal event in itself. I won't be making tax or spending uh, announcements on Tuesday. Mm. Um, what I will be doing is signalling some areas where we want to consult ahead of the budget in the autumn. We should be very careful about looking at single sets of figures, one quarter or two quarters. We need to look uh, uh, at what's happening sustainably in the economy. And if there is uh, the, the flexibility, the space to do something, uh, then we'll decide in the autumn how we're going to use that. But we will continue to take a balanced approach, addressing the debt problem, investing in Britain's future, uh, reducing taxes for hardworking families and putting money into our public services. Simple question, is austerity over? Well, uh, we've, uh, if, if, most people take that to be a reference to the public sector they pay do, cap. Yeah. Uh, and we've removed the 1% pay cap on public sector pay. As you know, um, unions and management right now are in discussions on a settlement for nurses and other Agenda for Change staff in the NHS, which I hope will lead uh, to a pay settlement which satisfies uh, workers in the NHS, but is also fair to taxpayers because it tackles some of the challenges that we have uh, in the NHS but workforce the, and makes it more effective and efficient. The working families affected by these welfare changes, for instance, £200 a year worse off on average, that feels like no light at all at the end of the tunnel for them. Um, can I ask you also about local authorities? Because all across the country, you know, Tory local authorities as well as Labour ones are screaming with pain. They feel that austerity has been pushed absolutely to the possible limits and that they are now, in the words of one of your colleagues, facing a financial precipice. Isn't it something you absolutely have to do ahead of these local uh, elections to give them a little bit of relief at last? Well, uh, just to be clear, this is not a fiscal event on I know, Tuesday, so I, I won't be making uh, fiscal announcements. Local authorities have uh, over 200, well over 200 billion pounds of core spending power uh, over the coming over the five-year period from 2015 uh, to 2020. They've got reserves of 23 billion pounds. That's uh, higher than uh, in 2010. Eight billion pounds higher uh, than in 2010. But look, local authorities have done an incredible job. Uh, in uh, delivering efficiencies and over they're the now last in crisis. Years. Uh, and of course they're under some pressures, we understand that. Uh, at the spring budget last year I put an extra £2 billion uh, into social care because of the pressures there. Local authority, we've, we've also, given them, you know it's we've also given them greater flexibility uh, through the precept in the recent local government settlement so that local authorities now have uh, £9 billion worth of additional uh, dedicated spending for social services over the next three years. That is an actuarial answer to people who are screaming with pain in terms of the system being absolutely a breaking point. Uh, and, and look, we, we understand that there are pressures in the system. Uh, we look at these all the time. We discuss them with colleagues across uh, local government and indeed mm. uh, in spending departments across Whitehall. And as I said, when we get to the autumn budget, okay. we'll look at the numbers then. I'll be paving the way in this autumn budget 2018 for a spending review in 2019 which will look at public spending from 2020 onwards, what the total envelope should be, how we allocate it between individual departments and indeed local government. You're pushing off the good news until nearer the general election. Can I ask you about uh, another really important issue on the Tory backbenches, which is defence spending. Yes. You're, you, Tobias Elwood, one of your own ministers, has said 2% is just not sustainable these days. We have to go up to around 3% because of what's happened to the pound and the dollar. You know, the entire military system is in real, real problems. They need more tanks, they need more planes. And a lot of your colleagues on the backbenches are determined that you're going to have to do something for them. Well, look, I was Defence Secretary for nearly Indeed. three years and I yield to no one in my admiration for the armed forces and what they do to keep... Uh, Britain safe and I also understand, a bit of cash as I well also as understand the huge complexity mm. of the defence budget, some very very long term uh, projects that are at the cutting edge of technology but uh, some of the media uh, talk as if defence was being cut, let's just be clear about the facts here, well, defence defense will receive uh, more than a billion pounds extra uh, in each year of this parliament, it's the fastest growing uh, resource budget um, in Whitehall. So defence isn't being well, cut by any means. Now, you say that, I, I accept that there are pressures on defence, uh, including uh, foreign exchange pressures, because mm. quite a lot of the military equipment we use is bought in US dollars. dollars. Yeah. And um, the Prime Minister uh, has announced uh, a defence 
modernization program where mm. she and I and the Defense Secretary are working closely together on looking at these uh, challenges. Okay. And of course, we're, we're committed to making sure that Britain is always uh, properly defended. But it's, it sounds like yet more jam tomorrow. Can I read you something that Nick Timothy, your uh, close friend, said? Mr Hammond must now declare an end to the age of austerity. The government has achieved its surplus. It can invest in the economy for the long term. It can start to increase public spending. Well, I, I'm afraid uh, Nick Timothy is ignoring the debt. We have a debt of £1.8 trillion, 86.5% uh, of our GDP. All the international uh, organisations recognise that that is higher than a safe level. And this, isn't well, some, this isn't some ideological issue, uh, Andrew. It's about making sure that we have the capacity to respond to any future shock in, to the economy. Push back there will be economic that. cycles in the future. We need to be able to respond to them without taking our debt over 100% of GDP. John Redwood, um, no kind of softy on these matters, uh, wrote in a, in a blog this week that basically the debt, in terms of if you analyse it properly, is easily sustainable and really suggested that the austerity programme was a political choice, not an essential economic one. Well, with the greatest respect to John Redwood, I think he's wrong. Um, we need to get our debt lower. I think most people in this country would be horrified to be reminded uh, that we have £65,000 worth of public debt for every household um, in this country. But look, what I did when I became Chancellor was change the fiscal rules. I said, we will, we will tackle the debt, we have to tackle the debt, but we will spread out the time over which we do it a bit longer, creating a bit more flexibility so that at the same time as tackling the debt, we will also invest in Britain's future, we will also put money into Britain's public services, uh, and we'll relieve Britain's families and small businesses yeah. with some tax breaks. That's what we've done. That's what we intend to go on doing, being balanced in our approach. It's wrong to say, is, as it, some fiscal is your say, real that message? it's Sorry. wrong to say that every penny of, of capacity we have has to go to paying down the debt, but it's equally wrong, uh, as John McDonnell says, that every penny should go into additional public spending. Okay. We need a balanced approach. I must ask you about Brexit. It's clearly going to be an incredibly complex negotiation. The Prime Minister said when she, I was talking to her last week that you know we wouldn't get the full amount of access to all markets we've got at the moment. You have a very, very complicated, grindingly complicated difficult and difficult negotiation over the future of the City of London and financial services coming up. You spoke about that this mm -hmm. week. Is it worth it? Yes. Uh, financial services is a very important part of our economy. But it's also... Not the financial services negotiation. Is Brexit worth oh, it? Oh, the whole thing. Um, yes, yeah, the whole well, look, thing. The British people have decided. The British people mm. decided that we are leaving uh, the European Union, and that's what we're doing. Uh, our job is to make sure that we get the best possible deal for Britain, that we make uh, a smart Brexit, a Brexit that works for Britain, British jobs, British prosperity, British businesses. And that's what we're all about. Do you accept that we're going to take some kind of economic hit, as Mr Tusk has said, and as a lot of these impact assessments suggest? Well, look, Mr Tusk is a negotiator, and I listened to him carefully on Wednesday, and he didn't say anything that I wouldn't expect a skilled and experienced negotiator to say at the beginning of a negotiation. He basically said um, the deal will have to contain none of the things you want and all of the things that we want. Well, that's, that's an, an opening negotiating position. I recognise it well. OK, looking at what you have said about the importance of financial services, banking and insurance in particular, you have said again and again and again, this has to be part of a fair deal. Can I ask you, is this at last a government red line? Oh, we've, we, we've said, the Prime Minister said very clearly in her speech, that the way to negotiate successfully with the Europeans is not to threaten, not to um, uh, talk about walking away from tables or anything like that, but to engage, to talk, to discuss these things, uh, to explore the options. The reason I think that financial services has to be part of a deal is firstly the shape of Britain's economy. Services are a very important part of our economy uh, and a fair deal will need to be one that covers services as well as goods. And secondly, because the financial services system in London is an asset of Europe as a whole. It serves the European economy as a whole. 1.1 trillion pounds worth of loans but to European companies facilitated through the City of London. A vast proportion of Europe's financial services business transacted through the City of London. But you know that they are thinking differently 
from the French in particular saying, you know, you're not going to get this kind of deal. So if we get a deal that does not include financial services, that would be an unfair deal. That would be a bad deal. Well, I don't accept your premise, Andrew, because I think we well, will get a deal that includes financial services. The question is how financial services are included, what the kind of access is that we're able mm. to negotiate reciprocally, because there are many European banks operating uh, in London, yeah. of course, as part of London's financial services. OK, now. well, at least we now know what the government wants out of this negotiation. The Prime Minister's speech, your speech and ma many others have set out a much more detailed pr prospectus for the country. Have you modelled the economic effects of that? Not yet. Uh, we haven't, Why not? We haven't even embarked on the negotiation yet. The next step in this process at the European Council later this month is hopefully to agree the implementation period so that businesses know that they can plan over mm. the next three so, years with certainty. So you've then we, we will also get the guidelines from the European Union for the next phase of negotiation. Then we start uh, talking with them about the shape of a future partnership, which will cover not just uh, e economics, trade and investment, but also uh, security, domestic security and external okay. security. So modelling tomorrow, like jam tomorrow. But it well, will once, come. Once, we'll see it. once we know what the deal we, looks finish, like, so. then we will certainly model, model it. All right, Chancellor of the Air. Thank you very much indeed. That